national education uh, is 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 an example of uh, you know I think most of us think it's kind of good for people to be able to read and whatnot, but it's also a a a, a force for uh, cultural uh, oppression and uh, homogenization. So, for example, um, uh, for about five hundred years in the country I currently live in, if a school child spoke Welsh in a school, you would hang a, a, a sign around their neck as a badge of shame. And that is called the Welsh Knot. So now I will just look very briefly at uh, the relationship of, uh, of language to nation building, uh, comparing uh, the 19th, 19th century Europe with modern Asia as a sort of context for um, for, uh, for for field work and language documentation. So in uh, 19th century Europe, linguistic description was a cornerstone of nation building in at least three ways. Uh, philology of ancient varieties of national vernaculars. Think of like the, the, the you know, the, the Germanic sagas, for example, you know, the one, one way you were a nationalist was to look at what was the medieval poetry in my vernacular. Uh, then also there was work done in, in, in dialectology, dialect grammars and dictionaries, also dialect maps, uh, and that's the third one is systematic dialect geography, where there is this notion, uh, particularly in Germany, uh, but then also in, in, in later in France, uh, of like to uh, really appreciate you know who the German people are, we need to really study Germany as it's spoken in each of the German speaking villages and and understand uh, dialectology and and folk traditions. Yeah. So for whatever reason, these elements of a nationalism do not seem to be repeating themselves in in Asia. That's my observation. Uh, philology of ancient varieties, everyone pays lip service to it, uh, but only in China do you see a major investment in it. Like, like in India, you know, as much as the BJP loves Sanskrit, you don't see uh, people uh, uh, poring over Sanskrit texts and doing editions of Sanskrit texts as a kind of manifestation of Hindu nationalism. Uh, and as far as dialect grammars and dictionaries go, there's a little bit of work here and there, but, but again, it really doesn't seem like um, the the modern states of Asia feel the need to express their their national identity through uh, linguistic uh, field work, and that's uh, worrying, I think, because it means that uh, those pressures on a decreasing linguistic diversity that come with nation states like national education and and uh, increased travel uh, are there, but the countervailing pressures of, of documenting and celebrating um, linguistic uh, diversity are not there like they were in 19th century uh, Europe. So now I just uh, look very briefly at how things are going here in the UK. So Welsh is doing well, Scots Gaelic could be doing better, Cornish died in uh, 1777, Manx died in 1974, uh, but there are revitalization efforts uh, going on with Cornish and Manx. And then I think that something that can focus our minds is that the Cornish and the Manx have been able to do revitalization because the languages were well studied and well documented. Whereas, for instance, when when Minyak disappears or, or uh, what have you, uh, it's not clear that, that even if a community uh, later wanted to revive it, that they could because there wouldn't be enough um, done. So our job in, uh, as, let's say, as historical linguists, by virtue of historical linguistics, needing to look at uh, uh, a variety of languages from a family, and uh, our job as uh, descriptive linguists looking at um, the range of, of, of languages in the world is a very hard one because of the quick uh, pace of cultural homogenization backed by national governments and corporations. 
and, uh, and documentary linguistics has even fewer resources uh, than it did in the 19th century, is, is, is my uh, perception, that in the 19th century, you could go to a, a, a national government or an academy and say, give me loads of money to study dialect uh, diversity, for example, and they would, uh, whereas that's not so much the case anymore. So we need uh, technology to help us. So let's look at some new technologies. Well, uh, just to kind of focus on this, 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 this theme that I'm elaborating of, of um, technology brings you improved uh, standards of living, if you like, uh, increased productivity, but also new forms of oppression. I think this is very true with the very technologies in a way that I'll be talking about. So looking at um, the role of um, digital communication uh, in uh, controversies such as uh, the surveillance of the NSA revealed by Edward Snowden and the, the Cambridge Analytica's role in uh, the Trump uh, election in 2016. Uh, but we can, if we're sophisticated users of technology, also uh, resist uh, these forms of uh, oppression. Uh, so for instance, there's the Tor browser, which is a, which is a browser that uh, cannot be monitored uh, by governments. So uh, I use that myself a lot. <laughs> uh, it's not very good for making bookings at restaurants, uh, I'll have <laughs> you know, but, um, uh, and uh, you can also have encrypted uh, email accounts like uh, Proton Mail is the one uh, that I recommend. And now moving from this general uh, s uh, situation of kind of how has technology shaped the modern world in terms of uh, increased productivity and uh, increased uh, oppression and the ability to resist that uh, oppression, let's look at how those same uh, tendencies are manifesting in academia, I think broadly. Uh, so, you know, so I'm going some, from sort of big to small sort of society at large, academia, and then uh, linguistics. And uh, I have been sort of surprised actually uh, uh, in the past that some of these things have not been known to, to, to PhD students, for example. Uh, so, so I think it's worth uh, talking them through. So I'm going to look at YouTube uh, library genesis and Sci-Hub in particular. So in the context of my uh, ERC grant that, that just ended in August, we put a lot of the talks uh, on YouTube. Uh, and I think that's uh, hugely advantageous to, to scholarly dissemination. And I think actually that one of the uh, advantages of the coronavirus uh, that we're seeing now is that academics who tend to be very conservative uh, are, are, are figuring out how to, to use um, uh, uh, technologies. And you can do things like have people from all around the world attend uh, a doctoral school. Uh, but also I think we, we should try to put as much of that as it makes sense to into, uh, the, into public access. Uh, and just imagine if you know, uh, we were able to watch talks by uh, Brugman or Desersur or uh, I don't know the greats of of uh, linguistic history. Well, I think we we if if we find that idea attractive, we owe it to the future to try to document some of our presentations, uh, so that that uh, now that it's technologically possible, it can can be realized. So now. Uh, I will talk about uh, library genesis. So this is a way to find uh, books and, and uh, books in particular. It works a lot like a, a library catalog. The, you have to check the URLs because it, it, depending on where you live uh, or what's going on in the world, the URL can change. So I put in uh, to this search window, Nathan Hill Tibetan. And then, uh, like in a library catalog, various uh, things uh, come up. And one of them is my 2019 book. And then you click on it. Uh, you can get the PDF file, and uh, there's the book. Yeah. So you've just saved yourself uh, 85 pounds and uh, have a, a, a relatively new book. So especially, again, uh, in the coronavirus time, this is a way of uh, 
you know, accessing uh, scholarly resources that uh, might not be as accessible as they were in the past. And then if we look at uh, Sci-Hub, that's better, better for articles. So uh, similarly, you may have to check uh, what the URL is, uh, and you can basically just Google something like, where is Sci-Hub now? In this case, first we go to the home page of the article in question. So I found one here, use of reflectance transformation imaging in recording and analyses of Burmese Pew inscriptions. And we look for the DOI. You see the DOI at the bottom. The DOI is a you know unique uh, identifier, like an ISBN number for a book. And then you can copy that. Uh, of course, if you have access to this journal, you can just click through to the journal. But I'm presuming maybe you don't. Uh, they want to charge you 30 pounds for for looking at this article, something like that. So then you go to SciHub. You uh, put in the the uh, DOI and then it brings the article right up. So uh, that is a way to get respectively books and articles uh, using uh, <laughs> you know, new technological resources in, uh, in the 21st century. Although I should mention that uh, whether or not uh, it's legal is something you should uh, consider for yourself uh, in, in your jurisdiction. In Burma, it would be perfectly legal, yeah. So, um, so that's, it for very sort of generic research, technological resources of scholarship in, 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 in general. Now I will look at uh, something specific to, to uh, language documentation. So there are uh, a bunch now of language archives, uh, which so what is a language archive? Yeah, when you when you document a language, you produce sound files, video files. It's a place that can host in perpetuity those files in some kind of curated fashion. And I'm going to look at them a little bit, uh, one at a time. So this is a, a one called Paradisic, which is based in Australia and is particularly strong in Australian languages. Um, I'm not super familiar with it, but some uh, colleagues who, uh, whose opinion I respect a lot uh, like it a great deal. It doesn't charge money for deposits uh, and uh, is quite accessible. Uh, next, I'll uh, mention ELAR, the Endangered Languages Archive, uh, which is based at SOAS. And personally, I find it quite difficult to use uh, it's hard to figure out whether they have a resource on your language uh, that, or the language you're interested in. Uh, in many cases, the, or I should explain that this is tied to a grant program, the Endangered Languages Documentation Project, where if you're given a grant by the Endangered Languages Documentation Project, you're expected to deposit your data in the Endangered Languages Archive. Now, a lot of people, I would say as many as half uh, of the people who get these grants do not end up depositing their, um, their data because they're bad. Uh, but the system still records a deposit that's sort of wait, waiting for them to deposit their, their data. Um, and uh, and uh, I mean, just for example, inside of Tibetan linguistics, uh, Mark Post is someone who got a grant to, to I think, work on Galo, uh, and his deposit is, is listed, but there's no files. And then it just makes you feel crazy because you, you look, you see there's a deposit, you can't find any files, you think you've done something wrong, whereas it's actually that the depositor hasn't put anything in there. And you have to have an account to use it, so it's, 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 it's not my favorite. Uh, although, uh, you know, I should say the, all of the decisions that have been made, uh, you know, uh, in deference to my SOAS colleagues were made for, for reasons uh, that, that do make sense for some circumstances. And then here is uh, Dobez, uh, which is, uh, was associated with a grant uh, program by the Volkswagen Foundation, which is now closed, uh, but they still will host uh, new data. And without kind of going into too many details, my complaints are similar. I, I find it sort of hard to find things. A lot of things aren't accessible. There's different sort of levels of security. 
Uh, my personal favorite uh, endangered language archive, if you like, is uh, the Pangloss archive uh, based at the uh, CNRS in Paris, uh, specifically at the La Cito lab. And uh, why do I like it? I like it because it has an extremely flat structure. There's no sort of, oh, look here, look there, log in, get permissions. It's just a bunch of home pages, very flat. What you see is what you get. And then uh, in general, you, you like here, you get a, a sound file that's glossed, that's translated. Uh, they, uh, yeah, okay, so I'll stick on this one for a little while. Um, it's, it's a small enterprise and very French, uh, you know, um, which makes sense. It's based at a French lab. It's paid for by the French taxpayers. Uh, uh, but that does mean that it tends to be languages that were studied by people who work at La Cito that are covered. Now, that's good for me because uh, that lab has done a lot of work on Sino-Tibetan languages. I think it's worth noting that they will take deposits uh, from you know, the public as long as you uh, format your data and whatnot in a way that's easy for them to ingest. And, um, and I would recommend that. Yeah? I think that like, if, you're, if you're going to go to the trouble of reformatting your data for uh, an archive anyhow, you might as well go with Pangloss. And at the technical level, uh, every deposit gets a DOI, which is not true, for example, at ELAR. And that DOI is resolvable down to the sentence level. So then if you want to cite, for example, someone's data in a paper of yours, you can you know, just give that DOI that, that then will take someone immediately to that exact sentence that you're citing. So I think that is, is also the sort of cutting edge of scholarly practice. So, um, you know, just to sort of uh, pause on that thought, I like the Pangloss archive <laughs> and uh, would encourage you to uh, take a look at it. And also to, uh, to, if you are in the language documentation business or doing some field work yourself, consider giving your data to uh, the Pangloss archive. But then in the, uh, Let's say if, if, or uh, in terms of transition, let me just say another thing I want to uh, tell you about is Zenodo. And uh, it is a, a generic data research repository supported by uh, the EU and uh, specifically by SARN, you know, where they do the atom smashing. So most of the data in it, like you see here, is kind of from, uh, let's say, hard sciences. Uh, but I think it's worth us asking ourselves, why do we need special uh, language archives? Yeah, language data is just research data. So why can't we use a research data repository like Zenodo? And now I'll just tell you what's good about Zenodo is it's totally free, extremely easy to use. There's no upper limit on a uh, number of deposits or, and a single deposit can be up to 50 gigabytes. So um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's just the most user-friendly thing out there. And each deposit generates a, a citation and a DOI. Uh, so it also gives a lot of advantages in terms of um, citation practices. Uh, what are the disadvantages? Uh, the only disadvantage really is that it doesn't provide a, a good uh, interface or sort of user experience for people to look at your data online. And I would say that's been an emphasis in the design of other language uh, archives is that you can, you, know, you can play a video and you can look at the transcription while you play the video. Whereas in Zenodo, it's just, here are my files. You can download them, and then you can read them on your own computer if you, if you want to. But I think that's not so bad. I think that if, if we make it easier for researchers to share their data, then more researchers will share their data. And uh, the more people share their data, the more we'll be able to you know, uh, have a kind of a rigorous uh, scientific enterprise where our findings are verifiable. 
and and maybe too much effort has been spent on worrying about making kind of lovely interfaces for language archives. So that's my pitch for uh, Zenodo. And uh, and personally, when when I get an article these days on like a morpheme or something in a language that's based on fieldwork, I ask to see the the data uh, because I think. Uh, that's good practice, and and we should all be sharing our data and uh, and well and 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 making the relationship between our data and our research findings uh, clear. Now I'm going to talk about auto completion keyboards, uh, which I've moved here because it's it's more a technology that benefits uh, communities that use uh, understudied languages than a technology per se that benefits researchers. But I think it's exciting and, and useful and want to draw people's attention to it. So uh, w one thing that, that I've even had trouble explaining sometimes is what is a, an, an, a, an auto-completion keyboard. I'll get to that in a second, uh, but you all use them all the time. and. Uh, you, using these sorts of keyboards, let's say, uh, is participating in the spying on us by major corporations, but we all do it uh, when we use our own phones. So my own feeling is, uh, you know, um, the, the benefit of participating in that kind of spying regime is that you get better commercial products for your language. And that would be a good thing for minority languages to participate in. Uh, yeah, this is what I just mentioned. There are there are privacy issues around uh, the collection of data. But let's look at uh, Microsoft Swift Swift Key, which is the the it's the auto completion keyboard that I use uh, and that I've helped in developing. So this is from my this is a screenshot from my phone, and you see there's uh, there's Tibetan. And there's Welsh, I, are our languages that I, that I have used, uh, and then it, it suggests some other languages based on your uh, location. And uh, this is uh, me just uh, proving that it works for a language, uh, Atong, where uh, basically a, a friend of mine gave us some data for making an Atong model, and he couldn't uh, figure out how to use it, so I was just sort of showing him how to use it, but but I don't actually know Atong. So um, the point is just uh, we we type something and then it says maybe the next word you want to use is is this one. I mean, I, I think everyone probably uses auto completion keyboards on, on their phones, but I, I have found that when I've ex tried to get linguists to give us data, they've said, what's an auto completion keyboard? Why should my language community want one? Um, uh, but uh, when you, you know, when you type and you say, you know, uh, hello, and then your phone says, do you want to say how are you? And then you say yeah, okay. I'll say how are you. That's an auto completion keyboard. And there's a lot of linguistics research that goes into making them. So just let's look at uh, some some a mix of this is mostly Sino-Tibetan languages and uh, and um, Filipino languages uh, to give you a sense of what's in Microsoft SwiftKey. And I myself have been involved in Tibetan, uh, Hmong, Russo, Atong, Hani, and Galo. Uh, and you see the number of users and the vocabulary size. And, and, and here I, I just, uh, the, the point I want to make is kind of the, the usefulness of, of documentary linguistics to, to, to real people, right? There are 5,311 people in Mizoram who are using this software on their phone to write in Mizo. So, so you know, a little bit of work by a linguist has really helped uh, these 5,000 people. And um, in some cases, uh, which is a point to keep in mind, the numbers look good, like 2,000 Tibetans, uh, almost 3,000 Tibetans, but there are 6 million Tibetans. So it's not good sort of, let's say, to use commercial terms, market penetration. But if you look down at uh, Atong, 157 Atong users, there's only about 2,000 people who speak Atong. So I think 157 is not so bad. Uh, so that's uh, 
that's what now I'm done talking about auto completion keyboards, uh, but I'll, I'll say part of the reason why I'm doing it is a, a pitch, uh, which, which is that if you look at uh, Microsoft Swift key and there's a, a language there that you would like to be there that is not currently there that you have some data on, then you can talk to me and I'll talk to my friend Julian, who I've worked with uh, making uh, some of these models and we can add it. Um, so, uh, so I think that's a good, a good opportunity for helping uh, communities that use uh, less supported languages. So now I will get uh, into the actual discussion of the workflow of uh, documentary linguistics and then at some point switching over into uh, comparative linguistics as we as we get to that point in the workflow and there are basically three phases that I'm going to uh, break it down into the first one is automatic speech recognition the second one is a uh, natural language processing tools writ large uh, but there's this notion that's been kicking around since I think the late 90s, a uh, basic language resource kit, which I, I think is a useful notion. So I will uh, discuss that. And then uh, computer assisted language comparison, which is to say that the, you know, the, the contribution of technological uh, development to historical linguistics per se. And uh, just sort of to give you this sort of overview perspective, this second one, NLP, is where most linguistic research in um, commercial enterprises happens. So Microsoft, Facebook, Google have lots of people doing NLP. Uh, and for them, automatic speech recognition has been one NLP task, uh, but for us, uh, I think it's good to separate that out because the way you approach it if you're working on a language with a lot of resources and the way you approach it if you're working on a language with few resources are very different. So the, the, the extensive commercial research in NLP doesn't really advantage us that much when it comes to automatic speech recognition, but it does for other tasks. Uh, and then computer-assisted language comparison. Well, of course, uh, you know, um, commercial enterprises have not been super interested in reconstructing proto-languages. That's no surprise. <laughs> There's not a lot of money in it. So that's not something that, that comes under the rubric of NLP really either. Okay, so uh, now I will look at automatic uh, speech recognition. And uh, just to remind ourselves that our sort of goal, if you like, is uh, to have interlinear glossing so that you might have a little bit of a sound file corresponding to its transcription into the IPA. And then you would have a, uh, that broken up into words or morphemes. And then under each word or morpheme, you will have a analysis of it. Uh, and that's the, the glossing, and then you might have a sentence-by-sentence sentence, uh, translation or some notes. So this process of changing your raw recordings into in your linear glossed text is extremely laborious, uh, and uh, to some extent necessary for using uh, linguistic field work in, in further research, but it's a real bottleneck in terms of, of people's time. You know, so, so I think basically everyone out there has far more recordings than they've been able to gloss. Uh, and uh, let's just uh, say that this, this standard, this practice of, of interlinear gloss texts, it's not, for example, at all common in Indo-European. Um, but it uh, has been uh, used uh, since the 1900s. And here, for instance, is an example of Franz Boas, uh, who did a lot of uh, work on native languages of North America. And you see uh, down at the bottom, he gives the, the forms and the, the glosses underneath them. 
So let's look at uh, recent uh, developments and, and basically, <laughs> to some extent, my whole discussion here is a extended advertisement for the work of uh, Oliver Adams and Alexei Michaud. And, and I have had a little bit of, of involvement, but a very tangential one. I'm more of a sort of fan. Uh, but I think this is a bandwagon to get on. So, uh, so I commend it to you. So Oliver Adams did his uh, PhD in, at uh, University of Melbourne, now actually works in, 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 a, in a commercial uh, NLP company. And the, the, you've, yeah, probably everyone has heard about neural networks. Uh, they've, they've, they, they, I noticed them about five uh, years ago, but they've really taken over um, artificial intelligence research agendas. Uh, and that's what he uh, is using. The input is audio uh, and transcription aligned at the sentence level. And uh, you need to train a model for the language and in fact the speaker that you work with. And this is where it's different than the, the big languages, yeah? So for English, you just buy uh, whatever, buy yourself an iPhone, turn it on, start talking to it, it writes down what you say. Well, that's because a huge amount of existing resources were already invested in that. Whereas we're starting from nothing uh, and trying to make progress in a way that benefits us as researchers as quickly as possible. So um, th 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 there's no, how can I say, there's no one size fits all answer. Each language is different, each speaker is different, but generally speaking, uh, one hour of existing, very accurate, glossed texts is necessary uh, to train a model, and if you have more than that, that's, that's better. And here is uh, the input uh, training, for example, where we have time-aligned sound files uh, with a transcription into the IPA. And uh, one reason this, this worked well with Oliver and Alexi is that Alexi is interested in, in phonetics. So he uh, makes very accurate transcriptions where you know, if someone pauses, if someone says um or something, he writes it in there. Because uh, many linguists kind of, even without noticing it, edit the text as they go. And you can't do that because a computer is listening to the sound file, so it needs to compare it to what the sound file actually says, not to some idealized version of what it should say. Uh, so in terms of, let's say, even at this stage, a recommendation to you is if you're doing field work on a language that, and you might want to take advantage of this set of tools, when you do transcriptions, please do them as uh, precisely as possible, where, where you write down what's actually said by the speaker, not any kind of uh, cleaning up. So uh, now, just looking at uh, the, uh, well, this, I, this is, yeah, this is just a, a slide showing the, the uh, preparation of a new uh, transcription. And here it is in uh, practice where you have a line by line, and I know, I know you're not gonna read this uh, just because it's a bunch of IPA for a language you don't know, but uh, the, the, for, for each line, there's the first one is the reference, which is the correct transcription, and then the, the hype is the hypothesized transcription by the machine and uh, just based on, the, on listening to the sound file. So the point uh, for our purposes is that it looks pretty good, right? Like uh, just, I mean, just look at any one spot and you say, oh yeah, the, the IPA symbols on the top line look a lot like the IPA symbols on the second line. So this can radically uh, increase the speed uh, at which uh, linguists uh, prepare transcriptions. But it's worth uh, noticing that, um, that, 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 that this slide may kind of overstate 
experientially the accuracy of the system because uh, common words it will learn well yeah that's just a, a machine is like a person in that way whereas uh, less common words it will learn less well so here is an example of a four syllable name uh, that comes up in the uh, in in the the transcription and uh, sorry in, in, in the texts and what you see here is a bunch of different sentences that the same name comes up in so the on the left is the is the IDs for the sentences and then at the very bottom you get the correct transcription yeah the the you know Alexi as a linguist has analyzed the phonological form of this uh, name as having uh, this um, this form and you notice that basically every time the system sees the name it does something different it's because a four syllable name is not something it saw enough examples of in the training to uh, to feel confident about uh, but still I think uh, correcting these incorrect transcriptions will be a lot easier than typing in uh, those the the correct transcription in the first place so so even when it's making mistakes, it's saving you time. So uh, this is just uh, an example uh, from, of, uh, of of the the wave file and the uh, the alignment of the sound file with the transcription. And uh, you, the, what's happened here is that the person has repeated the uh, the word. And the, in the second occurrence, it has uh, it has it has not identified it. Be, and the point that the slide is making is that the reason it hasn't identified it correctly is because of this glottalization, which is to say, even when the computer is making mistakes, they're not random mistakes. They're mistakes that are related to the phonetics that it finds in the wave file so even its mistakes can teach us things and and provide uh, linguistic insight so um here i'm uh, just listing a few uh, publications about this uh endeavor it's quite new about uh two years old making quick progress um, so hopefully in, uh, in the future, in the near future, this uh, set of, of tools, these technologies, can be incorporated just into the workflow of uh, linguists. And then I hope this, uh, this works. I just want to uh, show you a clip of a YouTube video where you can see this tool. The tool uh, is called Persephone. Uh, in action. So I'm going to allow. But now I think, can you, do you see the YouTube or do you see the slide still? The slide. Okay. You see only the slide, yeah. Okay, then I think I need to stop sharing. Yeah, and, then... and uh, Christophe, you have to be sure that uh, uh, you can share the sound. Um, so now can you see the the YouTube? Yes. Yes, okay. Well, I mean, uh, you can always, let's say, even if the sound doesn't work, uh, then you can uh, try yourself in the future. But let's give it a try, see what happens. Yeah, sure. So that's all we need to do to install Persephone along. And that way, it's just like any other plugin, any other recognizer that's been developed for a long time. So once it's installed, we can open a lawn and actually apply an existing Persephone phoneme recognition model I, sh I should have said, so this is a kind of a half hour talk mm -hmm. about an extension for Elon that uses this Persephone tool. And I'm skipping the whole first part where he's like, okay, this is what Persephone is. This is how you fit it into Elon to get close to where you get to see it in action. And because that's the sort of dramatic climax that I want is to see it in action. But, but, but I'm starting it a little bit earlier so that I can let uh, Christopher Cox kind of set up uh, its use himself. So I'll continue, yeah? To a tier of our liking in one of our transcripts. 
Now, to do that, we do need to tell Persephone a little bit of her me, Persephone Alon, a little bit about our Persephone model. So specifically, we need to let it know the folder where a Persephone model or experiment is, how that model was configured, so specifically which feature types we use for phonetic features, and what labels we use to provide the text, and where the original training data for that model are. Uh, Persephone Alon feeds that information back into Persephone behind the scenes to reboot that model, essentially, and then apply it to these new unseen snippets of uh, audio that we're getting from our Alon transcript. Um, now, I'm hoping over time that we can <clears throat> make changes to the Persephone source code to actually save these settings inside the models themselves, so that the only thing we need to provide to Persephone Alon is the path to our pre-trained model. But for now, this is information that we have to enter manually into the Persephone Alon interface. Um, for myself, once I've trained up a model in Persephone, I usually just keep a small text file that has all of this information there. In the example we'll see in a second, I've entered this information in the appropriate fields already. But again, these are the things that you should be able to recover from your model training process fairly easily. Um, so again, here's a short video uh, showing what this looks like. So here we have a transcript. And this is, again, the Tsutsuna language with all the blue starlights. So you can see we have a number of empty annotations or textless annotations on a main tier. What we want to do is provide that tier to Persephone's phoneme recognizer. So in the Recognizers tab, we select Persephone phoneme recognizer, and then we provide the settings I was just describing. So in this case, we trained our model using FBank, for phonetic features. Uh, the text that was provided this model, all those text snippets had this file extension. Uh, again, this will look a little bit different for your particular model. Uh, we built in support for Tutina's orthography here, but again, in your case, you'd most likely choose none. And what you'll get then are the actual phoneme strings that come out of Persephone with no conversions happening behind the scenes. Um, we want to provide this DRS tier. That's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the tier that contains all of the empty annotations that Persephone is going to try to recognize. Lastly, we want to provide it a reference to the directory where the original training data is. Uh, so in this case, for the Tsuchina model that we're, being, that we're using here. And lastly, <clears throat> excuse me, to the model itself, to the source experiment directory. Uh, there's a final field here as well for output recognized text. This is essentially just a junk file we can't get away with, <laughs> with producing. Um, Elon makes us do this. Uh, don't worry too much about it. Once we hit start, Persephone Elon will start picking out all the individual clips from that tier, uh, reload the Persephone model that we provided, and then actually ask Persephone to start transcribing each of the clips on that tier. Right? So each annotation is being fed to it. When we're ready, it'll load the corresponding tier, and we can listen to the results. You can see here it's recognizing all the segments, but also, also the tones that are marked with diacritics. Um, so as we mentioned before, there are a number of settings that you need to have. Okay, that's the, the part I wanted to show you. So I stop sharing and then, uh, and then go back to sharing my uh, presentation. Uh, not this one, right? Okay, uh, and I don't know uh, whether you thought that was cool or not, but I think it's pretty cool that that like uh, you know uh, uh, the the computer just filled in the IPA with the tone marks, correct? Yeah, and um, and although you know uh, it it took him some 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 training data, uh, uh, I think in this case about three hours of training data and uh, struggling with a computer to, to train a model and whatnot, uh, you know, once he's done that, then it works uh, forever and he can do 10 hours, 20 hours, 50 hours, and, and it's much uh, faster to, uh, to, 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 to make progress, yeah? So, so and also, um, as you saw in, 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 in Linda's uh, presentation yesterday, uh, Elan is is a very standard piece of software uh, to use in uh, language documentation. So the the point uh, of of 
this video and this tool that that um, that uh, Chris Cox has made is that it shows you can you can incorporate this kind of quite clunky um, you know a computer experty thing uh, Persephone into an environment that is uh, I mean, I don't know whether it's more user friendly or not, but is is already being used by a lot of documentary linguists. So uh, that's the end of the section of my presentation on uh, automatic speech recognition, and I would now move on to the next part about NLP, but uh, we're close. To, I don't I don't know we're eight minutes away from the half hour mark so I think it's maybe better to pause here than to press ahead but I'll defer to what Christoph tells me um, well uh, let's uh, let us let let's the majority decide okay. Although is half an hour too much maybe and or rather have ten minutes and then uh, close a bit earlier what is your feeling um, why don't we, or, or let's, let's uh, uh, say uh, probably, let's, let's, I'll do one more section, I'll do the section on NLP, and then we'll maybe be a little bit past the half hour uh, mark, uh, mm -hmm. but we won't be so late, yeah, and then okay. we'll see where we are, okay? Yeah, great. Okay, so, um, so, so now in terms of this this workflow, right, we've already gotten from having sound files to having some textual representation of our, uh, of our language. And that might be IPA or it might be some orthography. Uh, so now I will, I will turn to NLP, which is the, the kind of, so natural language processing, the kind of thing that, that, uh, you know, it, that's in your, in your iPhone if you have one. And I like to talk about, uh, in a somewhat facetious way, what I call Maslow's hierarchy of NLP needs, re referring to this, this idea of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where, you know, first you worry about uh, uh, eating, and then you worry about whether or not you have a home. Maybe some of you heard about it. Uh, so first you need to worry about whether or not your script is in Unicode. So if you're using IPA, no problem. If you're using Roman script, no problem. But uh, like uh, Tongut only very recently got in Unicode, and uh, Kitan is not yet in Unicode, so it is an issue for some languages. Then, after your script is p possible to in encode in computers, you need to have some texts that are actually encoded. Uh, so uh, you can't do anything fancy if all of your texts are still on paper or in museums. You have to have some e-texts. And then the next uh, question is, can you divide words uh, apart from each other? Where in uh, languages like uh, English or most European languages, we put spaces between the words, so they usually sort of come pre-word divided. But for, uh, for, for Vietnamese or Thai or Tibetan or Chinese, uh, words are not divided, so, so it becomes a NLP task to split the words apart from each other. Once you have words, uh, then you can analyze those words and, and particu in particular, you can identify the part of speech category of that word. Yeah, so especially if you think of, um, of, uh, of, of disambiguating uh, homophones, uh, part of speech analysis can be part of that. But now we're just sort of adding you know, more and more rich layers of analysis, uh, but uh, the idea is automatically. So after a part of speech tagging comes lemmatizers, where for instance, if we have a, a word like uh, sang uh, at, the, at, the part of, at the part of speech level, it will say a sang is a past tense verb. And then at the lemmatizer level, it will say, oh, it's somehow the same word as sing, even though you know, sing would be a present tense. And then once uh, you have that level, you can start doing syntax, uh, whether it's noun phrase chunking or uh, dependency relationships between verbs and nouns. Uh, and 
after that is fancy stuff that we don't need to worry about. So uh, I just want to, to sort of uh, take stock of some things that are available for English and that have become available for Tibetan. Uh, so uh, there's this company uh, that, uh, called Lexical Computing uh, that makes some very useful software that until 2022 is free for everyone in uh, EU higher education establishments to use. So you might uh, want to play around with it. And, uh, and they have corpora of, of a bunch of different languages, tend to be European ones, uh, with more or less detailed annotation. So I'm gonna stick with English where we can count on all the bells and whistles. And this is a word sketch that is done totally automatically, where it's looking at the British national corpus and the verb is chair. I use this verb because, uh, because it's good for demonstrating the need for part of speech tagging because there's also a noun chair that's a little bit more famous than the verb chair. So uh, once we've, uh, if, we're, if we're interested in the verb chair, we've already part of speech tagged so we can, we can find the verb chair. And then uh, we look at this sketch where it's looking at the whole corpus and then automatically telling us typical objects, typical subjects, and typical uh, you know, other, other grammatical interactions with this verb chair. And I think it's pretty impressive already. You get uh, people, basically people's names and, and uh, job titles are, are what chair things. And the things that get chaired are subcommittees, meetings, committees, seminars. So there's a lot of semantics uh, of, of a lexicographical kind captured by this sketch uh, that's all been done totally automatically, right? Uh, uh, the, the grammatical relations come from the corpus, the statistics come from the corpus. Even a little bit more impressive, I think, is this, which is the thesaurus function where looking at those uh, statistical relationships of grammatical use, like what, what, are, what are other things that people do to subcommittees is kind of the way to think about it. Uh, it ranks the, the uh, statistical uh, similarity between chair as a verb and other verbs and you get convene, attend, host, conclude, adjourn, organize. And I think this is really impressive because it, 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 it really is approximating uh, semantic similarity, which is, which is a notoriously hard thing to define and model uh, and has done it by this series of, of uh, grammatical uh, and syntactic uh, analyses then uh, scaled over a large corpus. So um, these screenshots, actually, I think I probably took back in 2013. So you know, this stuff in, in, in a language like English, totally old hat. It's, it was done a million years ago. Uh, but uh, a language like Tibetan, uh, we had a project at SOAS uh, from like 2012 to 2015. Uh, and uh, for Tibetan, these, these, these things didn't exist. So we were mostly working on part of speech tagging uh, and word breaking, and, and we did a pretty good job of that. And here is the Tibetan word galpo, which means king. And from a, a word sketch, these are, uh, these are verbs that uh, king tends to be the subject of, or let's, I, we say the agent because it's an ergative language. And uh, it's a little small, and probably most of you can't read Tibetan anyhow, but they turn out to be speech verbs, largely. So they're, they're uh, request, say, another verb for request, uh, another verb for, for request or say. <laughs> so lot, lots of uh, speech verbs. But then there's also some other ones, uh, think, give, uh, and then there's a verb that is used in a, in a, as a light verb construction in, in, in um, in you know in a construction that means invite, so these are you know not shocking things to see kings in, involved in, 
but I think it's, I don't know, I think it's cool and very useful uh, if you were, for example, running a Tibetan dictionary. Now, it, when we turn to the thesaurus function, it's a little less impressive. Uh, and I think the reason why is because of the corpus size. So this corpus is 80 million words, which may sound like a lot, but uh, is nothing compared to what they have on English. And we have a, a more recent Tibetan corpus that's about 150 million words. So I'm hopeful that once that's loaded in, we'll get more impressive results uh, here. Uh, but uh, this is what the system says are the nouns that behave most similar to king. And I'll just tell you what they are. The top one means God. Uh, the second one means uh, Lama or Guru. Yeah. So not so bad. You have sort of high ranking, socially high ranking animate, uh, you know, uh, entities. Uh, but then comes son or boy. And then person, which I think, well, you know, kind of uh, a king is a type of person, but not stunningly uh, impressive. Uh, and then the last one that's on the screen it means a victor. And that is, is quite good, I think, uh, compared to, uh, you know, a victor and a king are, are sort of semantically similar. So, uh, you know, the, for the purposes of this presentation, it's just uh, to say we, we have made substantial progress down the road of Tibetan NLP, and that work uh, continues. But it needs to be done for, for each language on Earth, right? And, uh, and uh, if the language has fewer resources than Tibetan, then you have to start from wherever that language is. And that might be automatic speech recognition. Uh, so th after this project ending in 2015, uh, I was busy with my ERC grant and I, I, I wasn't involved in the follow-up project, but there was a follow-up project on, um, on verb syntax, looking at, um, uh, classifying Tibetan verbs according to their, their governance, uh, relationships. And this is a, a screenshot from uh, the corpus uh, that that project has uh, delivered, uh, showing, uh, and I, I think personally that is a very beautiful um, interface. Yeah, so you, so you see, uh, I'll just talk to you a little bit about it. Like the D is a demonstrative, the C is a case marker, the A is an adjective. Uh, then we have another case marker, then a noun, then a de determiner, and then the verb. And there's an arrow that goes from the verb to the head of the noun phrases that it's governing. And in this case, we have a sentence that says, uh, there they erected each a statue of the great black one. So dare is the, the first syllable uh, at that place. And then nakpo, black, chempo, great. Uh, genitive of ku means body, actually, but here it means statue. Re each, and then and then zheng means to set up. Uh, so um, I mean, and and I don't want to sort of let's say uh, lead you to the impression that any of this is particularly easy. It takes a lot of work, a lot of uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and also a lot of analytical work. But once it's up and running, it's scalable is the point, right? Because like now we have a machine that will analyze Tibetan syntax and it doesn't care how much Tibetan you throw at it. So we can go, uh, we, can, we can get big data sets that we can use in our uh, research. Uh, 